This video series is brought to you by Dunleary Ratdown Libraries in association with Mark the Science Guy and supported by the Dormant Accounts Fund. The resources used throughout this series are part of the SFI Discover Primary Science and Maths programme and is Aero Ireland. Hey everyone, the heating's broken in the steam lab today so I'm trying to find other ways to keep warm. I sent Ali off to get some extra coats and jackets. I don't know where she is. Come back. Oh, hey Ali. Uh, where, where are all the coats and jackets? I'm wearing them. Where are my coats and jackets? I'm wearing them. Uh, I didn't have any luck with the fire either. How are we going to survive? What do you think you need to survive, really? Well, survival's all about the things needed to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And I know you couldn't survive without your phone. No, <laughs> but that's not what I mean. Um, so what we need to survive is pretty similar to what plants and animals hmm. need to survive. We all need air the right temperature, water, and nutrients. Mm. But not all plants and animals get these the same way that we do, mm -hmm. or the same way as each other. Our needs are a little bit different. My diet is not the same as a bear's. Well. And I don't need it to be quite as warm as reptiles do. I get too warm for that. I'm not able for the heat, you know? Yeah. Oof. I've witnessed that. Wintertime can be pretty difficult for plants and animals. So let's explore some of the ways they cope with the changes in weather. Whenever we get thirsty, we take a drink through our mouth. Yep. Water is really, really important for humans because it makes up about 60% of our bodies. Our blood is made mostly of water and that carries nutrients to all the cells in our body and oxygen to our brain. Water also flushes out waste, toxins and all sorts of bad things from yep. our bodies Everything. and it keeps us at the right temperature. Most animals take in water through their mouths, like we do, except they don't tend to use cups and bottles, opting more so for the direct approach. Some animals have pretty nifty ways as well of dealing with dry conditions when water levels are low. Some burrow underground or hide under rocks to avoid the hottest parts of the day. Some large lizards also store water in their tails for when things get really tough. Hmm. Other animals like giraffes eat a huge amount of plants which contains large amount of water in their leaves. So giraffes actually only drink free flowing water every couple of days and they get most of their water through their diet. Oh, well plants don't have mouths, but they do get thirsty. Imagine if plants had like human mouths and they were like full of teeth and they were like... Arr. What should they talk about? You. They... <laughs> oh, huh. Well, they don't have mouths, but how do they drink then? Well, they take in water through their roots from the soil in the ground. Then it travels up to the rest of the plant. Ali, let's investigate. Okay. Okay, so what you're going to need to investigate how plants drink is a jar or a beaker. Yes. Okay. You're going to need some water. Water. You're going to need some food colouring. Excellent. And then you're going to need some stalks of celery, the kind yes. with the leaves attached. And some lovely white flowers. Lovely. Okay. Okay. So what first thing you're going to need to do is pour some water into your jar or okay. beaker. About half full? Yeah, about half full. Alrighty. Okay. Okay. Now you're going to add some colouring to your water so that we can actually see what's going okay. on. Okay. I want to give me a... Give me a Sweet, sweet green. A green? Yeah, Ooh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm gonna give yeah. you some green and I'm gonna go okay. for um, some super red. Okay, a few drops. Okay. Ooh, okay, yeah. Looking nice. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so next thing you're gonna need to do is to put your celery and your flowers into the jars of water. Okay. Before you put your your flowers in though, it's a good idea to just yes. trim about a centimeter about off a centimeter. the bottom. Just gonna cut it off the bottom, just like. <laughs> coming right at you <laughs> okay so pop your flowers into one jar and pop your celery into the other jar okay and then you gotta be patient then okay we wait you gotta wait a couple of days we actually made some earlier in the week as we well did. We did. you don't have to wait they look like okay mm. check these out the flowers changed color the colored water moved up through the plants to the petals changing the color it also changed the colours of the leaves at the top of the celery. The water level has also dropped because that coloured water has moved up through thin tubes called xylem. They're kind of like straws that carry the water around the plant. We can see them pretty clearly as coloured lines moving through the stick of celery. The water is then brought around the petals of the flower and the leaves of the celery. In fact, if we cut a chunk off our stick of celery and look inside, you can see little dots of colour. 
These are all of those xylem tubes. And if you have a magnifying glass or a microscope, you can look at them a little bit closer. Oh yeah, very cool. So that's how plants drink water. Now, after getting that water in, plants usually lose a fair amount of it through the holes in their leaves. Kind of like how we lose water when we exhale or sweat. But not what you want to happen in winter, when it gets especially cold and the water can freeze. Those plants are going to hold on to as much water as they can get. In the autumn and winter months, as we've seen, lots of plants and trees lose their leaves. And that way they can make sure that all of that water that they suck up from the soil doesn't just immediately get lost through their leaves. Other plants shrink back in winter and get lower to the ground. So the cold winds can't reach them, which can also take some of that water away. Plants can even grow in really, really yeah. cold conditions in the Arctic. In areas like this, the plants all tend to be really, really mm -hmm. low to the ground and they grow quite slowly. Yeah, those plants have adapted to where they live which means they have special characteristics that can help them survive this. And lots of animals have special adaptations mm. to live in really, really cold areas as well. So let's have a look at some mm. of those and check them out. When you're cold, what do you do? Rub your hands together? You put on a coat, a hat, a scarf. That works. Yeah, but maybe you do. <laughs> Why does that actually work to heat you up though? Well, heat moves from something warmer to something colder. But if you put something around a warmer object to keep the heat in, then you have an insulator. Some things are better insulators than others. Things that let heat pass through them easily are called conductors. And metals are really, really good conductors of heat. You might have noticed that, you know, when you make a cup of tea and you leave the spoon in it for yes. too long and it gets really, really hot, you got a conductor there. Yes. And air is a good insulator. So things which have air trapped in them, like cotton wool, sponges, fiberglass, fur and feathers, they're all good insulators. Oh yeah, and during the, the cold weather, birds like fluff up their feathers mm. and that traps more air in between them, which helps to keep the birds mm. warm. Animals that live in really cold environments like polar bears and penguins have a thick layer of fat under their skin to keep them warm. But the places where these animals live can be so cold that this thick layer of fat is just not enough. That's why polar bears have a thick coat of fur and penguins have a thick layer of feathers. Yeah, polar bears and penguins don't just put on an extra coat when they feel cold nope. like we do. Their fur and feathers act like a kind of coat that they're always wearing. Mm. And penguin feathers and polar bear fur are also covered in a layer of grease, which helps to keep water out. Mm. So we've seen that penguins and polar bears have many ways to keep warm. A thick coat of fur or feathers, a thick layer of fat under their skin and a greasy layer on their fur or feathers. Mm. But what if you were trapped at the North Pole? What materials would you choose to keep yourself warm? Let's investigate. Okay, so we've got some cotton wool, some kitchen foil and some bubble wrap. So let's see which would be the best insulator from the cold. And for this, what you'll need is some beakers or jars. You're going to need some elastic bands to keep your materials in place. You're going to need a thermometer and you're also going to need some hot water. So the first step is to wrap your beakers in your different materials and use those elastic bands to keep them in place. So we did that earlier. So we've got our beakers with our different materials here and we've left one beaker with no covering on it. We haven't wrapped any material around it because we want to make sure that our materials are better insulators yes. than none. So the next step then is to fill your beakers with the same amount of water because we want to make sure that each of them is the same, that the only difference between them is the material that's wrapped around them. Now do be careful because you are starting off with hot water. So it is important that you're careful with that. And one more. When you have your beakers full, you're going to go. use your thermometer to measure the temperature of the water. And you're going to check it at regular intervals and write down your results in a chart like this. So take the temperature measurement, regular intervals, every minute or so for about seven or eight minutes. Okay. Let the testing begin. The results are in. Mm -hmm. Let's see which material kept the water the warmest. Mm -hmm. In first place, we have the bubble wrap. Ooh. Oh, bubble yes, wrap. All numero that air, one. All that air trapped inside mm. acting as a good insulator. In nice. a close second, we have cotton wool. Mm. Oh, no and surprises there. in third position, we have the aluminium foil. Okay. Followed by our control sample. Hmm. Okay. So which material would you make your next winter coat out of? Mm. Test out different mm. materials and you can cover the tops of the beakers as well to see if that makes mm -hmm. any difference. Or you could even wrap them in materials of different colour to mm -hmm. see if that has any effect. Now, Mark, I don't know about you, but I absolutely love food and I, uh, 
I eat nothing else. <laughs> we all need food to survive. It's what fuels <laughs> our bodies. Now, we as humans can go to the shops all year round to buy the food that we need. But for animals, it's not quite as simple as that. Did you not see the video of that penguin in Tesco? Hmm? Penguin bars? No, he's in the queue. <laughs> Adapting new ways to get food is important for animals to survive. And some animals change their behaviours to get food, while other evolve physical traits over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. Mm. For example, giraffes have evolved to have long necks. That helps them reach up high into trees to get food that other animals can't reach. This means they're not competing with other animals for food, meaning more food all round. For horses, their teeth have adapted to help them oh. eat. So as horses eat grass and they grind it up in their mouths, their teeth start to wear away. Okay. So eventually they'd grind their teeth down to nothing and then they'd starve. So to combat this, horses have evolved teeth that continue to grow throughout their lives cool. so they can keep on munching. <laughs> Snakes have evolved special jaws, which means they can eat far larger meals than you'd expect. And this is important in areas where food is scarce and you have to eat what you can, when you can. Mm. Other animals have changed their behaviours to make mm. sure that they're well fed. Like those animals that work together as a team to survive. And you can see this in animals that hunt in packs, like wolves and hyenas. Oh, yeah. So working together increases their chancing, chances of getting food. Mm. But obviously there are some downsides to this as the food oh, has to be shared, shared out. Mm. But some food is definitely better than no food. Fair. That is true. Now, and some animals hibernate during the coldest months of the year when the food is scarce. And mm. during that time, they completely slow down their mm. bodies oh. and their metabolism slows down, leaving their bodies working just hard enough to keep them ticking over until springtime. Yeah. Other animals choose to move and migrate mm. when the yeah. weather gets cold Get or food here. gets scarce. <laughs> so they'll move to a different location mm -hmm. for the winter months. And this is seen a lot in birds. Uh -huh. Like in Ireland, we see a lot of bird species during the summer that spend their winters in other parts of the world. Mm. So they might go to places like mainland Europe or Africa where it's a bit warmer. Yeah, and winter is here now though. And with all the bad weather, many birds who stay in Ireland need our help to stay alive. And at this time of year, birds find it very hard to find insects, worms, seeds and berries because the ground freezes and the trees are bare. But we can help by feeding the birds. Aww. Let's make a bird feeder, fill it with seeds for our feathered friends. So to make your bird feeder, what you're going to need is you can recycle an old plastic water bottle with a cap. You'll need a scissors, something for poking a hole with, a pencil, some string or twine and some bird seed. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make our perch for our birds yeah. to sit on. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to poke some holes inside our bottle. So we're going to poke just about a third of the way up from the bottom of your bottle. You're going to poke a hole using your corkscrew or you can do this with the scissors. So poking a hole all the way through the bottle, give it a little wiggle around and then poke another hole on the opposite side so that your pencil can go through. That's it. So once you've got your two holes, you can thread your pencil between the two. Mm. Like that. A little bit of elbow grease. Bit of elbow grease. <laughs> Beast! Too much elbow grease! The next thing you're going to need to pop in is the string that's going to hang your bird feeder from a tree. So near the top of your bottle, again, you're going to make two holes opposite each other. So we're going to poke one through on each side. Like that. And another hole on the opposite side. Lovely. Okay. Now you're going to want to cut a piece of string. So grab your string and cut a section off it like that. Yep. And then thread your string through those two holes that you just made. Just tie a knot at the yep. top. So that's gonna give you a loop that you can put over a branch of a tree or hang onto a hook on a wall outside, yep. like that. Now, next step is we are going to fill our bird feeder, okay? Yep. So you can buy some bird seed in the shop. You can also use things like sunflower seeds, peanuts, just don't use salted or roasted. <laughs> um, keep them the, the nice simple kind. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna pour them inside our bottle okay so Ooh. once Ooh. you've filled your bottle all the way up to Pack the top in. with bird seed mm. pop your lid on and uh, our bird feeder is really starting to to yeah. come together here but there's a bit of an issue where the birds can't get at any of the seed so what you're going to do now is 
Take your hole puncher again yep. or use a scissors or a knife. Use adult supervision. Mm -hmm. And you're going to poke holes all around the bowl mm -hmm. and that will let the birds get their beaks yes. in to get some of the seeds out. The holes can be a little bit easier to punch now that there's seeds inside. So pop it in, make a few holes all the way around your bottle. Make some holes of different sizes so that different kinds of birds can mm -hmm. eat from your bird feeder. Uh, once you've made holes all the way around, this is your bird feeder. Very cool, check that so out. So you can hang your bird feeder on a tree outside where you can see the birds from your house. Mm -hmm. Make sure you hang it out of reach of cats yes, though. Yes, very important. Uh, and be patient, it might take a few days for the mm -hmm. birds to start to come and eat from your bird seed. But be patient, yep. have a look and take note of which types of birds come a munching. Okay. So, I think it's time to take these out and hang them on a tree. Okay, cool. Okay. cool. Thanks everyone for joining us today in the Steam Lab. We hope you enjoyed all our fun investigations. And remember, they're all available on the SFI Discover Primary Science and Maths website. Download them, have some fun at primarysciences.ie. From us, let's go feed the birds. Let's go feed the birds. This video series is brought to you by Dunleary Ratdown Libraries in association with Mark the Science Guy and supported by the Dormant Accounts Fund. The resources used throughout this series are part of the SFI Discover Primary Science and Maths Programme and Azero Ireland.